Thank you. So in fact, uh, you know, last time after my lecture, I got some questions about uh, thick and localizing subcategories. So I thought in, today I would spend uh, discussing a little bit of this. I'll get back to the duality theme um, on the next lecture. So there is one reference, at least for people in algebra, commutative algebra, that might be useful some, uh, about thinking and thinking about thick and localizing subcategories. It is this paper called finiteness and derived categories of local rings. And this, yeah, okay. So let me begin actually, I'm taking a page from Suresh's, uh, taking a page from Suresh's lecture and, and I decided I'll uh, write some of the stuff. So this is mostly a recap. So I introduced the uh, derived category last time. So we are starting with a ring R and C of R, so I'm not insisting that it be commutative or anything for the moment. So C of R will be the category of R complexes. And for me, a complex is going to be unbounded on either side. So it's, uh, it's but it'll be indexed, uh, it'll be lower grading. So it's a different, and the differential decreases degree. So these are the objects of the category CR. And morphisms are what we talked about before. So there are maps between the corresponding complexes, which are compatible with the differential. And given such a morphism F, you have an induced map on the homology. And the total homology is what this is, H star of M. And one says that F is a quasi isomorphism if the map in homology is an isomorphism. So it's just nice, yeah? so it's bijective. And we are really interested in complexes up to isomorphism. So you want to identify two complexes as long as they are quasi isomorphic, meaning that there's a map or maybe a, a zigzag of maps linking them, which are quasi isomorphisms. In other words, we want to invert the quasi isomorphisms and make them actual isomorphisms. So if you let Q be sort of the class of quasi isomorphisms in the category of chain complexes, you can, uh, as I said, what you want to do is invert the quasi-isomorphism. So the D of R will be defined to be this category obtained by inverting them. So it's a localization process. And of course, this, is, this has its pitfalls because you know this is a class of maps and so on. So what any, in any case, one wants to get a good handle on what this is doing. You want to understand that when you can do the, when you localize, some, when you invert the quasi-isomorphisms, what it is you're ending up with. And a good way to get a handle on this construction, the localization construction is using the machinery of model categories uh, that Rekha talked about yesterday. In fact, this is one of the motivations for this uh, general machinery. And so here's a model structure on the category of complexes. Um, uh, so the so weak equivalences, so these are the ones that are one of the structures that is one really interested in inverting. So these will be the quasi isomorphisms, the class Q I mentioned here. Now the fibrations will be morphisms of chain complexes or complexes that are surjective in each degree. So this is what this indicates. So if you're looking at Dwyer and Spalinski, which I recommend as a good source for this sort of thing, they focus on complexes that are concentrated in positive degrees, in which case there's a slight fiddle in degree zero. But I'm looking at unbounded complexes, so then the morphism suggests the fibrations will be morphisms that are surjective in each degree. And then the cofibrations will be maps from M to N, which are, well, first of all, you want F to be injective in each degree. And the co-kernel should be semi-projective. So this is, so as I said, you know, these are the analogs of CW complexes in the world of algebra. And so let me recall what is semi-projective complexes. So it means that it has a filtration like this uh, uh, by subcomplexes P0, P1, such that the quotient is a, first of all, it should be a graded projective. So the quotient is a complex. So in each degree, it should be a projective R module and the differential should be zero. So you know, the differential of Pn plus one goes to Pn. You know, you'll see this sort of thing coming up everywhere. So even in Somnath's lecture just now, when he talked about Sullivan models, 
there was a condition that there was some sort of ordering where the differential maps elements of a certain order into uh, the subalgebra generated by elements of a lower degree. This is a similar condition. So it's saying that it maps the differential maps Pn plus one into Pn. It has the same flavor. And the quotient is as simple as it gets. And by a graded projective, I just mean that it is a projective module. Uh, it is a graded module where each in each degree, the module is projective. By the way, I hope somebody's keeping an eye on the chat. If there are questions, don't hesitate to interrupt. Okay, so maybe the comment I should make is that uh, if you take any complex of projective modules, now in, so in general, this need not be semi-projective, but if it happens that eventually they're all zero to the right, okay? So this is what the condition is. So eventually they're all zero, then this complex is semi-projective. So this sort of lines up with what Rekha said that in, a, in if you're looking at chain comp complexes which are concentrated in positive degrees, then you can just define the co the cofibrant objects to be things the complexes of projectives because then this condition is automatic in that context. And what is the filtration? Well, it's the obvious one. You just look at uh, the piece of the complex to the right of a given integer. So P n would be just this subcomplex of P. Okay, so the upshot is that there is a model structure in the category of complexes with peak equivalence is exactly what you want. So the derived category is then equivalent to the homotopy category of semi-projectives. Okay, so what that means is that if you want to compute morphisms in the derived category, so this is what this indicates between two objects, two complexes M and N, this will be the morphisms in the homotopy category of the corresponding cofibrant replacements. So what is cofibrant replacement? You just take projective resolutions. I should really be saying semi-projective resolutions, but okay. So replace M by projective resolution, N by projective resolution, and look at uh, maps between them, but look at only homotopy classes of maps. So, so this is how you think of, one can think of the derived category. As, some, as a homotopy category of semi-projectives. Now the key point for, for what I'm interested in is that it is a triangulated category. So there is a bunch of axioms there, but really uh, when all it boils down to is that you can take direct sums. So here the co-products are direct sums. So take a collection of complexes, the direct sum of the complex is still a complex. And there are mapping cones, which are typically called exact which give rise to exact triangles in the category. Okay, so this is the analog of the glowing construction from topology. So these are the two key operations in the derived category. You can add things or take direct sums and you can construct mapping codes and glue things. So this brings me to the two key concepts that came up in my last lecture. So let me state it in slightly greater generality. Take a non-zero um, subcategory, so a subcategory which is not just the empty subcategory of B of R. We say that it is a thick subcategory. If it is closed under mapping cones, so should, uh, if you take two objects in T and, the, and take any map between them, the mapping cone of that is also in T. And then it's closed under retract. So which is basically taking direct summons and the finite direct sums, the emphasis is on finite. So take any finite collection of objects in T, their sum is also in T, all right? So this is what a thick subcategory is. So maybe I should say that uh, one, one might think of this as the analog of ideals in the world of rings. And these are interesting precisely, uh, more or less for the same ideals, uh, reason ideals are interesting. Maybe another comment I can make if you're encountering this for the first time is that thick subcategories are kernels of exact functors. And uh, kernels of exact functors are thick subcategories, which is another reason you might care about these things. Okay. And a localizing subcategory is the same thing, except that you allow, instead of finite direct sums, you allow arbitrary direct sum. So it's some sort of infinite process. So this is what a localizing subcategory of D of R or of any triangulated category is. So now if you 
take any complex, R complex, I'm going to write take of M for the smallest thick subcategory containing M. And there is such a thing that there are, you can construct it, uh, you can give a constructive definition of thick M. And log of M would be the similar thing, but for localizing subcategory. Okay, so this is thick and lock. And what we were interested in last time was that you can approximate any object by objects in lock of M. So if this is what this fact is. Remember this, I mentioned this last time as being a result of Dwarf, Farjun, and maybe Amnon Neiman, depending on your training. For any object, any R complex X, there's a functorial exact triangle in DR, uh, which looks so. So this is cell, so going from cell M, which is, an, which is an R complex, which is built out of M. So meaning that it's in the localizing subcategory generated by M. So these are the various things, various terms I'll use to talk of complexes here. And this side of the triangle is orthogonal to the things built out of M in the following sense that there are no maps from any object in block M to LM. Okay, so, so this is built out of M and this does not, or M does not see this. That was one way to think about it. There are no maps, for example, there are no maps from M to this object. And we speak of this as the M cellular approximation of X and this as the M localization of X. Okay. And the main, the, this exists and really, uh, and I want to sort of, uh, and convince you that this is an interesting construction that captures things that you have seen before or which will come up later. Okay, so now this is all from last time. So let me now begin. So I want to spend some time discussing examples. So the first example that I want to talk about is looking at the, uh, the case where you're looking at the integers. So so the module category over the integers are not, nothing but abelian groups and the derived category of integers are complexes of abelian groups. So the first thing uh, in this, so the first uh, say object you might think of the simplest object in some sense is Z mod P, a P is a prime. Okay, I claim then that uh, the thick subcategory generated by Z mod P are all the finite torsion complexes, P torsion. So what do I mean by this? So, th sorry, this is equal to the complexes. Okay, so first of all, they have to be finite. So, so this is zero for all large I. So I'm using the absolute value of the degree here. So it's a bounded complex, uh, at least in homology. And each homology module is P power torsion. So it's unhighlighted by some power of P. So I'll think of this as a P torsion, P power torsion complexes. Okay, so, uh, so here's a, so let me actually sketch this. So let me first ch check this for modules. So one thing is clear though, that um, all such complexes, uh, sorry, anything built out of P, uh, finitely built out of P must be, have bounded homology and must be P power Tosh. So this inclusion is sort of clear, or I'll let you think about it. Because when you take, uh, you know, it's just a question of following things on, exact triangles and finite sums. So if you take the mapping cone of object, which are, which P power torsion homology, the mapping cone will also have that property. And the same thing is true for direct, finite direct, well, any direct sum actually. But okay, you lose this condition if you allow infinite sums. So this is where the finiteness comes in. If you take a finite direct sum, the finiteness of homology is preserved, okay? and as to, okay, so that's this condition. As to this one, so first consider the P power torsion modules. Say M is a abelian group, so M is in mod Z and P power torsion. So 
So then M must be a direct sum of a Z mod P to the NI maybe, but NI are integers. Hmm? Some finite direct sum like this. So I, we want to check that uh, the claim is that any such M is in, can be built out of, finitely built by Z mod P. So it's enough to check, so to prove. Ah, bad choice of M. I said M is Z mod P, so let me call this X. So check that X is and thick M. It suffices to prove that uh, Z mod P to the N in thick of Z mod X is finitely built out of Z mod P for all integers N, non-negative integers, all right? And this you do by induction or one can do this by induction. And you just look at the, you know, there's an exact sequence like this. You can filter Z mod P N by Z mod P. So you can send one to P to the N minus one. So you have an exact sequence like this. So this gives an exact triangle in D of R, in these in D of R. Z mod P N. And now by induction, you deduce that. So, you know, for n equal to two, so for if you take n equal to two, you see that you have z mod p, z mod p square and z mod p. So clearly the z mod p square is in thick M because you see, you can get it. It's so the, the, the condition that it's closed in the mapping cones means that it's, uh, if you have an exact triangle and two terms of the triangular is in the thick subcategory, the third one is. So you see that this can be realized as a mapping cone. I should actually stick in a negative suspension here, if you wish. So you can see that this is a mapping cone of such a map. So it's built, finitely built out of these two, and then you get Z mod P square, and then you induce. So using this uh, exact triangle on induction on N, you see that all Z mod P to the N's are finitely built out of Z mod P. So once again, let me emphasize, this is saying nothing more than the fact that Z mod P to the N has a finite filtration with the sub quotients are Z mod P's. Okay, and so this takes care of uh, Z mod P to the N. So this takes care of proving that all P power torsion modules are on thick M. And now to take any, okay, so this tells you that's all P power are in take M and you can do a, a standard truncation argument gives you the result for complexes. You can discuss this in the discussion session later if you wish. Given any bounded complex as a way to see that you can build it out of its homology groups, finitely build it out of it. So if you want to prove that a complex is in the, in some thick subcategory, it suffices to know that the homology modules are, uh, completes the proof, so, and then this does it. Okay. So this tells you that the thick of Z mod P, uh, the thick subcategory generated by Z mod P are just the uh, complexes. Ah, oh, I forgot one. Yeah, I forgot to say one more thing. It's not only P power torsion, but also finitely generated. The homology modules ought to be finitely generated and P power torsion. And uh, sort of a similar argument, but maybe it's a bit more of maybe less standard induction argument tells you that 
can also recognize the localizing subcategory. Oh, okay, maybe let me just say it, the log of Z mod P is all complexes here with no boundedness assumption such that HI of X is P power torsion, need not be finitely generated. Again, one inclusion is clear that anything that is built out of Z mod P is P has P power torsion homology, but the uh, reverse inclusion is a little, takes a bit more of an argument. All right. So this describes the thick subcategories of uh, uh, generated by Z mod thick and localizing subcategories. So they already in this simple example, there is a interesting point. So maybe I'll leave it as an exercise. If you look at thick of Z mod P, this is going to be the thick of Z mod P to the N for all N. Yeah, no matter what, uh, so you can look at, in fact, you can take any P power torsion complex and the thick subcategory of uh, P power torsion module, the thick subcategory generated by that will be the same as the thick subcategory generated by Z mod P. Okay, so this is an interesting exercise. So really the point is, uh, main point is that if you haven't done it before, it's worth doing. Z mod P to the N. So I just explained uh, here that you can construct Z mod P to the N from Z mod P by an induction. The interesting thing is how do you pick up Z mod P from Z mod P to the N. It seems a bit counterintuitive, but just remember that you're allowed to take direct summons. So here there was, there was no need to take, in the first, when you built Z mod P to the N from Z mod P, there was no need to take direct summons. But in this, you'll see that you have to take direct summons. Okay, so that's one example about abelian groups. Maybe the other example concerning abelian groups that's worth mentioning is the following. So instead of looking at, uh, just to link it up to what Somnath was saying, if you look on his previous lecture, not today's, if you look at all Z mod P's, where P's are all prime, so this is no longer finitely generated. And then the localizing subcategory generated by M, and actually this is not so hard to prove, these are precisely the torsion objects, things with torsion complexes, such that the homology modules are torsion for all i. Okay, i.e. Uh, H of x localized at, uh, uh, at q, so tensor with q is zero. Okay, so the reason I mentioned this is that in this case, the localization of any X with respect to this, this module M is the rational rationalization, if you wish, which is this. So the exact sequence you have associates to any complex. Uh, so this is the localization of X at Q, and this will be, you can define this to be the suspension of the mapping cone of this map. Okay, so this is uh, some examples of uh, thick and localizing subcategories. So there's something special about integers which makes these computations. So in fact, for the integers, one knows all the and all the localizing subcategories and thick subcategories of D of Z. Uh, this gets to be much harder for more complicated rings. So here's another example. So now, Instead of looking at the integers, let's look at a polynomial ring in two variables and factor over by some, say x squared or y squared. So these are just, you know, these are uh, more in Suresh's, the kind of thing that comes up in algebraic geometry. I'm just looking at uh, rings in degree zero. So, and you're factoring out the squares of the variables. So, here, so the, here again, here's an, it's not, you know, this is a finite dimensional K vector space. 
And it's not so hard to see that, that uh, any, uh, any module, sorry, that uh, thick of R, K, the residual field. So how, where is K viewed as an R module by factoring out the X, Y's. So this is all of, <clears throat> so it consists of all objects in D of R where this is so zero for all are large enough and the rank of these HIs are finite dimensional. So this is sort of the, what's called the bounded derived category of R. So you can build any complex which is, whose homology is finite dimensional. And so this is not so hard to prove, uh, but this may be a little bit harder to check that on the other hand, K is not in something like R mod XR, this cyclic module. I mean, this is interesting mainly because, you know, you can clearly map this also onto X because after all, onto K. K is a quotient by X and Y. So this cyclic module maps onto it, but you cannot build this out of this finite in a finite way. On the other hand, does belong to the localizing subcategory generated by this. Okay. Uh, in fact, in this example, no matter what finite collections of modules like this you take, you cannot build K out of that cyclic modules, finitely build K out of that collection. So all this I'm mentioning by way of making the, uh, to sort of saying the following thing, uh, so this is maybe my next, uh, my third part of today's lecture. That uh, so these are so I want to bring bring up some results that help you decide. So the the point I wanted to make was that uh, uh, detecting when x is in thick m or even lock M for a given M is quite, is generally quite hard. So what you're looking for really is some sort of invariance of X, perhaps that tell you that looking at these invariants, you can decide that X is in thick M, X and M. But this is typically a hard problem, but there is a very uh, beautiful solution in the world of algebra, at least in this uh, one, uh, the context of commutative Noetherian rings. So this is uh, really where the, so let now R is commutative and Noetherian. So the kind of examples you want to keep in mind are the ones that so maybe in, come up in algebraic geometry, look at a polynomial ring, a certain number of variables, and factor out by some ideal, yeah? So this is one such, uh, this K X Y mod X square comma Y square, all right? And the invariant that turns out to be, the first invariant that turns out to be interesting is something called the support. So remember spec of R refers to the collection of prime ideals and you can give it the Zariski topology. So the prime ideals in R is a risky topology. The topology doesn't play that much of a role in what I have to say, but it's there. Okay, now, uh, and given P in spec R, I'll write uh, K of P for the residue field at P. What do I mean by this? So this is the residue field of the local ring at P. So, localize R and then this, you know, okay. So this already came up in Suresh's lecture. The, okay, with this, I can define the support of a complex. So for the, so the support of any R complex, 
it's going to be the subset which uh, which I'll dilute so. So this is P in spec R such that if you tensor M in the derived category, so you're really doing derived tensor products, this is zero. So what this is saying is that, uh, so all the tors are zero. So, so if you take the, so the support consists of those primes so that when you tensor with KP, the residue field at P, M disappears in the derived category. So an object is zero in the derived category when its homology is zero. So saying that this is zero is ten, uh, saying that this is zero is saying that the homology, which is tor is zero, all right? In fact, at least for today, I'll focus mostly on the case when, uh, maybe the first important thing to say is the following. This is not exactly that easy to prove, but a zero or empty really, if and only if M is zero. So, well, okay, this is, a, this is a fact. So let's just say, take it for granted for now. So support does detect whether something is zero or not. So that's a good start. And I'll focus mostly on uh, the case when, when M is, in db mod r. Now, what do I mean by this? I should have introduced this earlier. So this will be the complexes. Ah, uh, with finitely generated homology. So let me write like this. So it's finitely generated r module. So this of course means that the whole homology module is finitely generated. So this means that all the homology modules are zero and each HI is a finitely generated R module. So this is the bounded derived category of R. So when you take something in the bounded derived category, the support is, a, is uh, there's another description of support you can just look at primes where when you localize, it is zero. Again, in the derived category, so maybe I should just say, which is of course the same as is zero. So you don't have to tensor with the residue field, just check whether after localization, this it becomes zero. So this is really coming from Nakayama's lemma. And this is also therefore equal to the collection of prime ideals containing the annihilator of the homology module of the complex, all right? In particular, this is a closed subset. Of spec. R. Okay, so it's, so for example, you know, this, uh, uh, the support of, if you look at Z, any Z mod P to the N, this will just be a prime, the prime P, the ideal generated by the prime number P. Whereas uh, this is of the case of the finitely generated example. Whereas if you look at support of Q, the rational numbers, this is just zero ideal. Uh, bring it up now because I'll come back to this example later. So you see, this tells you that it need not be a closed subset in general, but here it is closed. It's these are in fact. Okay, so do I want to say anything more about supports? No, no. So, uh, and okay, maybe the other point that's easy to check is that uh, if, and this just follows from how the behavior of tensor products, if X is in thick M or even lock actually, and its support is contained in the support of M. All right, so this is 
again, not hard to see, just follows from the fact that taking direct sums as taking tensor products commutes with direct sums and it behaves well on triangles. So this is not so hard. Okay, so this, but the converse is definitely uh, not true. Need not hold. In fact, by far it doesn't hold. For example, uh, you see Q, the support of Q, I just said is a zero prime ideal. This is certain, certainly contained in the support of the integers itself. Ah, <laughs> I got a bit ahead of myself. Um, this does actually hold in this context. That's not what I meant. Um, sorry, I got, so in particular, If X is in thick M, then you have this such an equality. I want to first talk about finite building. So then, and, but here the converse does not hold. So, this is the example that I mentioned. So over the integers, the support of the rational numbers is Z, certainly is contained in the support of the integers, which is spec Z. But Q is not built out of Z, finitely built out of Z. Right, anything finitely built out of Z is a finite abelian group, a finitely generated abelian group and Q isn't. Okay, but however, Q is, because after all, this is all of DZ. This is, remember I said that uh, a ring builds the derived category. So the localizing subcategory generated by the ring is the derived category. That's nothing more than saying that resolutions exist. All right. So in general, you don't expect support to be able to tell you whether uh, one thing builds the other, but there's a remarkable theorem due to uh, Mike Hopkins, which tells you that this does happen, but for small objects. From this, this is from 86, but there's also a different proof due to Neiman from 92. So let's say M and N in D of R. So R is now any commutative Noetherian ring are small objects or small complexes. then if the support of M, ah, let me put it like this the other way around, implies big M. So it's telling you that at least for small complexes, support is the invariant that will tell you whether one thing is built out of the other. And re recall that uh, M small means that, sm uh, M small means that it is sort of uh, small in the sense, the categorical sense means also that it's a perfect complex, which is the same as saying that it's finitely built out of the ring itself. And the uh, trouble with this is Q is not finitely built out of Z, it's more or less. Okay, so at least for small complexes, the support is an invariant that will tell you that whether one thing is built out of another. And so here, so I just want to make some commentary on this. So the first thing is, uh, look at our example. Uh, if, as I said, if you look at over the integers, the support of Z mod P to the N is the prime ideal P, which is the same as the support of Z mod P. And this is sort of abstract. So this sort of says, uh, this already, this tells you what the exercise I asked you to prove by hand. And it's worth doing by hand to see, to appreciate the difficulty in this sort of proving these sort of results that it does tell you that these two have the same thick subcategories. Okay. And 
So, and it, uh, oh yeah, so here, and certainly it's, uh, so this is the first comment. So this does cover that example. And you know, if you look at this example that I brought up earlier, So the support of anything is just a non-zero thing. So this is a local ring with only a spec R is entirely one point. That's the close point. So support of any M is just this spec R for all M not equal to zero in the Dirac category. As long as it's not zero. So that means that if you uh, the, all objects have the same support. They're all supported on the close point, but K is not built out of the car or even, uh, even those examples. Think of R models. Yeah. On the other hand, so you see, although these two objects have the same support, one does not build the other. So the point here is that in Hopkins's theorem, you do need Hopkins's result. A smallness is essential. You can't drop actually a smallness on either M or on M or on N. Okay, so th this is the second comment I wanted to make. The third comment is that uh, this, uh, the, typically the way the hopkins neiman theorem is stated is that this leads to a classification. So the HN theorem. Leads to a classification of the thick subcategories of The category of perfect complex, all the thick subcategories of uh, the compact objects in or small objects in in DR. I.e., I said uh, I said it in this way because now this actually fits into a larger picture where there are, you know, in the thick subcategories of compact objects of various interesting categories have been classified. In fact, the motivation for this result, so motivation for Hopkins proved this as sort of a toy model for something that comes up in homotopy theory and algebraic topology. And this is connected to nilpotence phenomena. This is the topic of an entire different lecture series. So it's <coughs> connected to some nilpotence phenomena and stable homotopy theory and also in the derived category of uh, rings. So Hopkins's theorem actually, though there, as I said, you know, there are really at least by now there are many proofs of this result of Hopkins and Neiman's. Hopkins's theorem is actually all somewhat constructive. So one, there is a, almost a constructive is uh, to some extent constructive. There is one input that you need, meaning uh, if, uh, also if uh, M is an N, you can actually write down a series of triangles uh, N small, so M and N small. So as long as you need M small, one can write down a series of mapping cone sequences that builds N out of M. I keep putting this in quotes because there's one in invariant that you need to compute that is not so easy to compute. Anyway, but it is sort of it's illustrative to look at the proof because it tells you what is going on to some extent, and that doesn't. So the Neiman's proof is different, and I'll mention that in a bit. 
And uh, is there something else I wanted to mention about this? So I already did the examples and this. Ah, so, uh, so Neiman's proof actually goes through the following theorem. So this is all about small objects. So you might ask what about uh, objects that are not small? So, uh, as, so in general, if things are not small, it's quite hard to, when M and N, maybe I should make this as a remark. So when M and N, it is hard to when N is in the can. So there's no algorithmic way, say, if I give you complexes or even just modules, there's no algorith algorithmic way to say when N is finitely built out of M. And again, keep this example in mind. The simple-minded ring, R mod X square, Y square, you know, K cannot be built out of R mod X, R, and it's not so clear why. I know this is true because I know that in this specific case, there are some other invariants like support that I can use to detect uh, detect uh, building, finite building, then maybe I should put it as a parenthetical comment. And this is actually an important result or important development. And R is what is called locally completed dissection. Okay. But what you have in general is the following result due to Nima. And now I remember what I wanted to say that for all M and N, any M and N in D of R, if then N can be built out of M, not finitely. Okay, so you can, N is built out of M. So not finitely. So this is in the localizing subcategory generated by M. So the comment here is that this implies or you can deduce the other result from this one. Because of a general phenomena that uh, in any triangulated setting, or maybe it's even broader than that, in any triangulated category, compactly generated. So let me not be too precise about that, but I, maybe I'll write it down. You can look up generated triangulated category. Oh, actually, you don't need that. Okay. If um, you don't really need it to be compactly generated, if uh, M and N are compact objects or small objects. then implies, and actually if one can be built out of the other, possibly in infinitely many steps and you can actually do it finitely. So this is a very general phenomena in triangulated categories, or maybe, as I said, maybe even more broader than, surely broader than that. That if you can build, if you have small objects and you can build one from the other, then you can build that infinitely many steps. So it's not hard to, so once you have this result, you can prove Hopkins Neiman. And this result here leads to a classification of the localizing subcategories of DR, but this is another story. Yeah, the last comment actually I wanted to make is that in my next lecture, I will sketch a proof, a different proof of Hopkins and Neiman that comes from some explicit models for cellular approximations that were discovered by Dwyer and Greenlees. Okay, right, I'll finish my lecture, today's lecture at this point. Could you go to the slide? Could you go to the slide uh, where the uh, where support the, uh, is defined? Support is defined. Ah, did I make a mistake somewhere? Hmm. Yes. What's the question, Manoj? Yeah. F tensor B non zero. F tensor B non zero. Ah, oh, thank you. Yes, yes. It's the other one always. 
Thank you. Yes, non-zero. Thank you, yes, of course.